Why is it important that we discuss the value of a salt marsh? First and foremost, for protecting it. We live in a very exploitative relationship with the environment. So being able to attribute a value, whether it's through a story or through a monetary figure, is important for decision making. It's also important to have the values in what people value most in the marsh in one's mind when you're doing future land use planning or you're doing sea level rise adaptation planning. You don't want to move forward with thinking that people value the marsh the same way that you may. This is FAU's Home and High Water, a podcast by the Center for Environmental Studies at Florida Atlantic University about research that uncovers how we live, adapt, and thrive in a changing climate. I'm your host, Cameron Peters. I want you to take a moment to look around you. What do you see? Wherever you are, inside or outside, you are located in an area where life, like you, bacteria, plants, and animals, exists with non-living things, like sunlight or temperature. And all of this stuff interacts in an ecosystem. Humans benefit from ecosystems in so many ways, like the clean water filtered through a forest, or the shoreline protection from mangroves. Scientists and economists call these ecosystem services. A monetary value can be given to these services. For instance, the cost of trees for timber. But what about the things that aren't quite as tangible? What if there are ecosystem services that the market doesn't put a price tag on yet? What if those services are so fundamental to our daily lives and to our culture, we don't even have the words to articulate their value? It might be more of a feeling. Our mind and body feels healthier when we're in that space. It's our home. It's a part of our identity. What is the cost of not having a complete picture of ecosystem services? And how can we create space for these missing pieces? Today, we dive into the story of a four-year, multi-institution project that took a diverse team of social scientists, ecologists, and economists into three coastal marsh communities across the U.S.'s eastern seaboard to try and understand not only what, but also how communities value a salt marsh. My name is Robert Johnston. I'm the director of the George Perkins Marsh Institute at Clark University. It's a human environment research institute, and I'm a professor of environmental economics. I've come to this project based on roughly 30 years of work on kind of linking biophysical and economic systems to understand values and behavior, right? Primarily focusing on, on how different human populations benefit or don't benefit from changes in in systems like salt marshes. My name is Colin Polsky. I'm a professor of geosciences at Florida Atlantic University, where I also direct the Center for Environmental Studies. My background is as a climate social scientist, so I'm interested in both quantitative and qualitative understandings of how people create, perceive, and respond to climate-related risks and hazards. Dr. Polsky and Dr. Johnston applied and received grant funding from the National Science Foundation's Coastal Seas Project, which stands for Science, Engineering, and Education for Sustainability. This project is led by Dr. Karen McLathery at the University of Virginia. This project supported a multi-institutional four-year interdisciplinary effort to examine how humans and their coastal environments are interacting especially in the face of increasing threats like sea level rise at three long-term ecological research sites known as LTER sites, also supported by the U.S. National Science Foundation. Specifically, their goal was to put the ecological dynamics of coastal salt marshes into conversation with the economic, human, and social factors. And to make a long story short, we were invited to participate in a a grant proposal that involved three of these LTER sites on the eastern seaboard to look at these dynamics in these three coastal zones in marshland uh, environments, in particular in Massachusetts, north of Boston, on the eastern shore of Virginia, and lastly in central coastal Georgia. Their project was called Coastal Sustainability, a cross-site comparison of salt marsh persistence 
in response to sea level rise and feedbacks from social adaptations, which we will refer to as coastal seas. And so when, when Colin came to me and, and said, hey, we, we have this, this proposal, would you be interested in joining us? I, it took me about 30 seconds to say, yes, this sounds fantastic. Since I was a, a grad student, actually, back in, the, you know, back in the early 90s, salt marshes have been something that I've been working on. I mean, salt marshes are, are a combination of a very highly valued system that is also at high risk. Up and down the East Coast, Storms, urban development, and chemical pollution are threatening marsh ecosystems, and in turn, the vital services they provide us. Invisible to the naked eye, these threats have been steadily building up in the marshes, often for decades. More recently, however, rising sea levels have been intensifying these stresses. Right, so it's a combination of what people are doing on the land and what's happening to sea levels due to climate change. So it's, that, it's that kind of catastrophic harmony that is really threatening marshes now and in the future. The question of how and why communities value coastal salt marshes has an immediate impact as sea level rise increases. Together, Dr. Polsky and Dr. Johnston's teams were trying to dig deeper into this topic. And this led Dr. Polsky to the question, are there certain things that people value about these landscapes that maybe it's even difficult to put a dollar value on from the revealed preferences or the stated preferences, a kind of methodological perspectives? To understand what this question is asking, let's begin by recognizing what a marsh is. A marsh is low-lying land, found at the dynamic boundary between land and water. It remains partially flooded throughout the year, resulting in a collection of plants and animals fine-tuned to thrive in these variable conditions. My gut feeling is to actually say it looks pretty boring, but it's not. Uh, they're normally made up of one or more different species of Spartina grass, which just looks like a grass. It's also called cord grass. Some grow higher, some grow lower. Also in Georgia, there's the Junkus plant, which is like a dark purple kind of bushy grass that is very sharp. So it just looks like a big expanse of grass with tidal creeks. It's obviously coastal, so there's water around it. It changes from the different times of day because when the tide goes out, you may see mud flats. So that's what it generally looks like. And then, of course, there's always visitors of different animals that are using the marsh as well as different people's uses of the marsh. So you could see the vast expanse of, of grasses, the three or two or one, depending on where you are, wading birds, hawks, all sorts of clams the mud, the crabs, but um, it's, it's pretty uniform. It's, it's almost monotonous, but in a comforting way. I'm Alyssa Joneswood, and I was a student researcher on the Coastal Seas Research Project. A marsh might mean something unique and deeply personal to each of us, depending on our engagement and history with this environment. But for each of us, marshes are critical. And whether you live next door or hundreds of miles away from one, your life is connected with this ecosystem. So salt marshes are among the most productive and threatened ecosystems on Earth. They protect communities from flooding and storm surge. They store massive amounts of carbon. They're important habitat and nurseries for wildlife, those that we eat and those that we just enjoy seeing. I could go on and on on the different ecosystem services or the different services that marshes provide just for human existence, for food, water, our ability to live on a habitable planet, but they're also important to surrounding communities for things like aesthetic reasons. They like looking at it for economic reasons. They depend on the fishing gains for recreation. They don't, for instance, people have stressful lives, but perhaps getting out and kayaking in the marshes, what gives you a sense of connection, peace, you get to have some exercise, get some vitamin D. Also, there's cultural values in the marsh. There's so many different ways in which the marshes have value in all ecosystems in general, but we were focusing on the marsh. The economic value of a marsh is often characterized using economic concepts that are easy to give a dollar value to, like property values, the total revenue from selling seafood, tourism expenditures based on the time people spend in the marsh, and other measures that are easily quantified. But they've also been valued in other ways that measure how much people would be willing to pay for certain services provided by the ecosystem rather than go without those services, like public access to green space or fish habitat. 
In October 2017, in pursuit of her Master's of Science in Geosciences, concentrating in human environment sustainability at FAU, Alyssa became one of many researchers to join the Coastal Seas Project. Alyssa focused her research on Georgia's salt marshes and communities. And in Georgia, in 1970, Eugene Odoms, who's like the father of modern ecology, who did a lot of work in the area, estimated the value at $2,000 per acre in 1970s dollars, totaling $40 million annually for the whole Georgia coast. And a local environmental group recently updated these numbers to $3.5 billion annually. Let's imagine the marsh as if it was a baseball park, with an infield and an outfield and surrounding spectator seating making up a baseball ecosystem. Now, imagine we have to decide how much that baseball park is worth. Historically, economists have relied on studying the actions or by surveying those who visit the park to figure out how much that space is worth. For example, how much they're willing to spend in time and money in order to attend a baseball game. But some types of sociocultural values, like a sense of togetherness, are difficult to capture using these monetary measures. Many people feel that these sociocultural values are at least as important as the monetary measures. While considerable effort has gone into estimating the economic value of wetlands in the U.S. and elsewhere, less effort has been placed into understanding how people value U.S. marshes in non-monetary terms. So the equation historically used to value an environment leaves gaps in the research directly impacting our ability to make decisions with a complete understanding of a marsh's value. Reflecting on our baseball park analogy, we might notice that there are some things that are missing from our initial valuation. What is the price you would pay for those Friday nights where, win or lose, families and friends gather together to follow the game on TV or radio? Or for the kids who look up to the professional baseball players they see out in the community? or the fact that the baseball stadium is a major landmark in the community that you drive by every day. It's familiar and comforting. Can you imagine your city without it? What do these not quite as tangible values look like for a marsh? So in addition to those values of the marsh that we can put a dollar figure on, people value salt marshes and ecosystems in many other ways, some of which are hard enough to put into words, let alone numbers. Scholars call these cultural ecosystem services. Which can include things like spiritual value, recreational value, aesthetic value, cultural heritage, perspective, educational value, and so on. It's oftentimes people don't even reflect on it. It's just something that they know. They don't really speak about it. Uh, but they're absolutely necessary part of the pie of the full or true value of the ecosystem services provided by the marsh. And this value is often described or expressed best in stories, art, or other means. And the Coastal Sea's goal was to figure out a way to quantify these missing pieces. To do this, they set up three focus groups in each state, where community members were quasi-randomly selected and invited to take part in a discussions-oriented study. Over the course of 90 minutes, Dr. Polsky and Dr. Johnston, with support from their student researchers, would ask the selected local residents questions about their relationship to the marshes, recording their answers verbatim. As Dr. Johnston observed the focus group conversations, he noticed a hopeful pattern. One of the things that we we constantly see, and I've seen this ever since I've been studying how people interact with natural systems, is that once you get people in a room and you ask them, well, how how do you interact with your local environment? In this case, we were talking about salt marshes, but it could be, could be many different aspects of the local environment. What you find is that all of a sudden, you know, a lot of kind of the, the, the political political divide that you see today out in the broader media, that goes away, right? When you simply ask people, tell me about your, your local coastal area. You know, what, what do you appreciate about it? What do you value about living here? What, what makes it special? All of a sudden you discover that, that people really have a, a similar way of looking at these systems and they really value them, right? And that's what's exciting about this project is getting kind of 
below the hyperbole and understanding how people truly understand and value these systems. And that's really useful, right, to provide that information beyond kind of the, you know, the shouting that, that sometimes happens in, in, in political and policy debates. And to me, that's really gratifying to understand that, that regardless of where you are, are in the political spectrum, that, that people really do understand how, you know, how these systems are special and, and, and why they value them. The stories the participants offered the researchers were key to understanding how the marsh ecosystem is viewed and utilized on the ground. The data that Coastal Seas was collecting has the potential for real-world impact because it was shared with stakeholders. Being able to attribute a value, whether it's uh, through a story or through a monetary figure, is important for decision making. When we collect these stories, it can add some weight potentially towards keeping a section of the marsh or the marsh in its entirety protected from development, from pollution, from other concerns. Also, it's important to have the values and what people value most in the marsh in one's mind when you're doing future land use planning or you're doing sea level rise adaptation planning. You don't want to move forward with the considering thinking that people value the marsh the same way that you may when the whole community could value, for instance, the changing of the color of the, of the Spartina grass. If you don't see a vast expanse of that, perhaps that value is diminished and you need to make sure that any future decisions made can retain that vast view that people can see throughout the year. One of the coastal sea sites became the focus of Alyssa's master's thesis, Georgia's Golden Isles community. One of the two counties she studied was Glynn County, which was described by Charles Seabrook's 2012 book, The World of the Salt Marsh, appreciating and protecting the tidal marshes of the southeastern Atlantic coast as one of the most contaminated places in the south. According to the EPA's record of contaminated sites, when Alyssa was there in 2017, it was home to 16 identified hazardous waste sites, eight brownfields, six actively polluting industries, and three Superfund sites. As noted in Sherry Baker's 1997 article, A Toxic Legacy, published in Public Health, one of those Superfund sites is regarded as the worst Superfund site in the South, and one of the worst in the entire nation. The pollution in the area is not incidental. It is an environmental justice issue. So this impacts people's health, it impacts the marsh's health, and people's ability to do certain things in the marsh. Many participants made comments about the pollution and how their use of the marsh over their lives most of our participants were 65 plus, just saying that, um, had changed due to pollution. It impacted their ability to, to recreate in the marsh. Some participants mentioned impacts from the paper mills in the area and about a proposed coal ash disposal site that was coming up the river a bit. People made mention to watching the tidal rivers and creeks get muddied up when they were kids. People knew about the pollution and they knew about the pollution sources and they knew other ones that were come down the pipeline. One participant said, it's a new normal. The pollution from those pulp mills have made a new normal, and people just don't know what things used to be like or how productive they used to be. And so I'm afraid that if we keep doing what we're doing and not dealing with the pollution issues, that we have a new normal, uh, and we will we'll never know how productive our systems and rivers and marshes could be. In McIntosh County, the second community Alyssa studied, the pollution is a daily experience for residents. So the obvious contamination of marsh in Georgia, and thus the seafood in the area. So McIntosh County, specifically at the time, had the second highest poverty rate in the state. And many people depended on fishing for subsistence, but pollution, specifically from pollution into the water, into the marsh, also the air, had an impact on fisheries. So it was impacting the water quality for subsistence and economic fishing. Shrimping, which was one of the major industries in the area, had been wrecked in the years coming up to the, the research by black gill disease. Black gill disease is exacerbated by the presence of heavy metals in the ecosystem, and the whole industry has been doing poorly basically for years because of black gill. And this contamination appears to be more common in poor communities and communities of color. When looking at the whole seas project, it was obvious that as you moved further south, the more polluted the ecosystem became. And also as you move further south, the blacker the communities got. And it didn't take us going home and doing the analysis to realize that. It was stark. It was in your face while we were doing the focus group discussions. It was clear as day that as we moved further south, the communities were more polluted 
and down to the point not even we know that the air is polluted because of the the factories in the area but you can't even get your protein source without having a risk to your health there were there's been fishing advisories in that area for decades as Alyssa went into each community to listen and record their stories the marshes and its history became an important part of the resident stories. Additionally, in Georgia, I looked at how public perception or value of marshes differed from local decision makers to just general public, if focus groups uh, provided different information than key informant interviews, and if there was a difference in how people viewed and valued the marsh in the rural part of the study area versus the suburban industrial area. So what did each community value most from the marshes and why? The coastal salt marsh ecosystems has historically been a critical part of Georgia's coastal communities. They're important in a really robust way. Almost any way that you could attribute value to the marsh, and that has been done or that hasn't been done, it's important to that community. So they have a point of pride because Georgia actually preserved the salt marshes in the 1970s, which is why more than one third of the eastern seaboard's marshes are in Georgia, even though it's only a hundred mile coastline. But the fisheries, the tourism, and culture, the, the feel of the community because of its coastal setting, the history of the people that have been there for hundreds of years, tied to the land and the land uses, it's integral to the community, quite honestly. Like the project's other two research sites in Massachusetts and Virginia, Alyssa's discussion groups brought together people from across the two Georgia counties she was studying. And prompted by a series of questions, the community members began to tell her stories about their experiences in the marsh, its quality and condition, and stories of flooding. While academic studies tend to explore the economic implications of marsh changes, what the research showed is the cultural implications dominate the community conversations and thinking. I was surprised that cultural ecosystem services actually came up most in both the focus groups and the key informant interviews, especially given that there is so little scholarship into cultural ecosystem services in general. I was almost expecting what was well-researched would pop up as the most commonly brought up thing, but it was so far from what we found. Also, if we're mostly valuing the marsh based on what we can attribute economic value to, yet cultural ecosystem services seem to be the most valuable thing to the residents, we're definitely not operating with a full picture in mind. And one last thing that really surprised me in the research results was I was really touched by how much the individuals we worked with in Georgia knew about their ecosystem and what was going on in it. They knew the animals, the names of them, the health of the ecosystem, the history of the area. So I was really touched by how people in Georgia could name all of the polluting industries in the area. They could remember when they were seeing tidal creeks muddied up, for instance. Uh, people were in touch with the environment there. From these stories, patterns emerged. So we ended up with a single long sentence to summarize what we found from these focus groups trying to elicit uh, in a very inductive way what people valued from a cultural perspective in their location. But I'll uh, give a, an abbreviated version here. In Georgia, for instance, the emphasis seemed to be on childhood experiences as being particularly instrumental for people's love of the marshlands in their area. And that people who had had childhood experiences, whether with their parents and grandparents, or as part of school uh, field trips, or what have you, led, as you might expect, to a greater love for the area and the ecosystem and uh, consequent uh, greater interest in stewardship and cultivation. What Alyssa was hearing in each focus group was critical, because it was also being reflected in the data drawn out of the participants' stories. And so even though these were kind of open-ended questions that had open, uh, non-structured answers, uh, we did a kind of a structured analysis of the transcripts of these focus groups. There were nine of them, three in each location. And the cultural benefits category dominated in all three locations. 39% of all references of themes in Massachusetts were in this category, 20% in Virginia, and 30% in Georgia. That is the number one uh, such rate 
for each of those locations. Although their community agency and engagement and protection was another theme in Virginia that also had 20% of references. These numbers make a clear statement. Cultural ecosystem services matter to communities. And not only do they matter, but they have shown to be an active part of the conversations the participants were having around the topic of marshes in the focus groups. I fully expected there to be some people talking about some of these cultural ecosystem services, the aesthetics, the spirituality, the serenity, and so on. But I didn't expect it to really dominate. But it did dominate. And so much so that I think Rob and I both have remained surprised at the extent to which the cultural benefits really dominated the conversation. And within cultural ecosystem services, themes emerged for how each site was valuing their marsh. So again, in Virginia, a marsh and shore identity. Um, In Massachusetts, this idea of serenity. And in Georgia, this idea of stewardship cultivation and a love for the habitat and to take some kind of personal ownership for it, even though it's a public good. There is, if you will, an unmet demand I think among stakeholders, people outside of the academy, to have these conversations and to help put a name to the things they're feeling and experiencing and to then put those things, those concepts into conversation with other things that are also important like the economic valuation. There's one thing that we've learned from studying environmental economics over the last 50 years, it's that that very often protecting the environment, protecting ecosystems is exactly the type of activity that benefits people in the long run. And that brings us back to Alyssa's research and the current state of salt marshes in the communities she studies in Georgia. So unfortunately, there's a a new additional source of pollution for the marsh. In September 2019, the MV Golden Ray, which is a roll-on, roll-off vessel that carried vehicles, capsized in St. Simon Sound. The capsizing of the ship, which is actually still in the water today, filled gas, heavy bunker fuel, diesel, antifreeze from the, the vessel and the cars it was carrying into the sound. It took a long time for them to even get a, a boom put up to try and mitigate some of that. So the marsh became even more polluted, unfortunately. They haven't really made too much progress on racial equity either, as um, Ahmad Arbery was murdered in Brunswick in the, the, the focus group area. So they definitely have been dealing with king tides, as they would every year. That's not really changed, besides perhaps gotten worse. The Gullah Geechee community is still struggling to retain their land. The marsh is still there, but getting a bit more polluted. But there's lots of fervent work done by local nonprofits in the area that have been doing what they can to protect the marsh. And I haven't been given any updates on how they're proceeding with any climate change adaptation plans. So besides knowing that the situations that were bad have gotten a bit worse, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't really know. The climate challenges facing salt marshes and the communities that depend on them are immediate and will continue to be so in the coming years. And this brings us back to the beginning and the vital question we started with. How do we value an environment? For the Coastal Seas Project, This was a research question that investigated how our current equation can be extended to include both the economic and cultural ecosystem services in order to reflect the complex value of a marsh, a complexity directly reflected in the community members' stories in not just one location, but three sites along the East Coast. And so that's one of the things that we were developing in this project was a set of tools to do that. And among those is, a, is what we call a meta-analysis or a study of studies, where we took information from dozens of studies that have been done previously in the U.S., each seeking to identify a certain aspect of salt marsh values. And by combining those in a big big quantitative model, we can come up with a tool or a model that enables us to predict what values are likely to be for other marshes that haven't been studied. And that's really exciting because now anybody in the U.S. who has a salt marsh that they want to understand values can take this tool and use it to predict certain types of salt marsh values. And from their research, the Coastal Seas team found that cultural ecosystem services are a necessary factor of the equation when valuing salt marshes. 
creating space for new research questions. Well, for me, I, I'd focus on the kind of three cultural benefits that we identified from each of our locations. Again, in, in uh, Virginia, that's a marsh and shore identity. In Massachusetts, there's this value for serenity. And in Georgia, this notion of stewardship. And for me, I would want to learn more about how representative those are, uh, those particular cultural benefits from these uh, habitats elsewhere in those states, as well as in the United States, in these types of settings. And that would be number one. Number two is I'd also like to try and test for how what we might find taking a similar approach in landscapes that are more urbanized than the places that we looked at. So at, at one end of the urbanized spectrum, you can imagine, you know, Manhattan or downtown Chicago. I mean, not necessarily those types of landscapes, but in, you know, more moderately urbanized landscapes, I would like to know if the same types of cultural ecosystem benefits that we saw in these more rural settings emerge as well, or if perhaps there are other cultural benefits in the different, more urbanized settings. This NSF Coastal Seas project, led by researchers at University of Virginia, Florida Atlantic University, Clark University, University of Georgia, Virginia Institute of Marine Science, and the Woods Hole Marine Biological Laboratory, offers an essential foundation for future research, investigating the relationship between communities and the marshes near them one grounded in a more complex and complete understanding of the vital services marshes provide and their impact on us. Home and High Water is produced, edited, and hosted by Cameron Peters. Additional script editing by Alyssa Joneswood. Music and sound design by FAU Assistant Professor of Music, Matthew Baltrucki, Zachary Binder, Brendan Lyons, and Matt Bilejic. Theme music by Matthew Baltrucki. Special thanks to CES director and FAU professor, Dr. Colin Polsky, director of the George Perkins Marsh Institute at Clark University, Dr. Robert Johnston, and CES research coordinator, Kimberly Vardman. You can follow Home and High Water on Twitter and Facebook at CES at FAU. You can email us at ces at fau.edu.